the lymphatic system is certainly an essential system in uh, the body. Um, it's often underestimated because, as we'll see, its anatomy is so diffuse. And so this is going to be an overview of the anatomy of the lymphatic system. Um, and I'm going to start off with lymphatic uh, vessels. Uh, the lymphatic system has two distinct goals. So when I talk about vessels, it turns out the uh, vessels of the body are not just blood vessels. There's also a system of lymphatic vessels. And so I'd like to then describe the uh, function of the lymphatic system in returning fluid uh, to uh, the blood. But then there's a completely different um, a function in uh, immunity and protecting the body uh, from uh, you know, microbes and uh, other foreign uh, invaders of which would you know go for the stuff of your body and so and that's going to be a little disjointed so I'm going to you know first talk about the vessels and how they return fluid from the body uh, 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 to the blood and then switch gears so that uh, we uh, set up uh, the discussions on uh, immunity and so the lymphatic system uh, you know certainly has uh, anatomy um, let's uh, begin with uh, the vessels in the blood vessel chapter, uh, it was mentioned that uh, when a capillary uh, is in a tissue, there's uh, two ends. There's an arterial end and a venule end. And at the arterial end, fluid tends to leak out because the outward pushing blood pressure exceeds the inward pushing osmotic pressure. And at the venule end, it returns because the reverse is true. That's not entirely true. It's mostly true. But it turns out that uh, a good deal of the fluid which leaves the cardiovascular system at these capillaries does not return. So a little more fluid is leaving the arterial ends than returns in the venule ends. Um, well, because these uh, capillaries are microscopic, uh, who cares? Well, it's certainly in any one instant, it's not a significant amount. Um, but by the end of the day, we're talking about a couple of liters of fluid. Right, and so you you know you have five liters of blood. You can't afford to lose three of them by the end of uh, today. So uh, the fluid which leaves these capillaries, we have to get it back. Now I'm going to be talking about fluid, but you know here's an obvious you know odd thing. So there's fluid here, and we give it a name. We call it plasma. Uh, there's fluid here. We give it a name. We call it interstitial fluid or tissue fluid. Uh, and then when the fluid goes in here, as you'll see, we give it a name, it's called lymph. So it's the same water. Um, there are maybe some protein you know, differences in which proteins are here versus there. Um, but in, in general, we're you know, just naming fluid for where it is. So please don't think of it as three different, uh, three completely different things. So in our tissues, we not only have blood vessels, these blood capillaries, we also have lymphatic uh, vessels, including these lymphatic capillaries. Uh, unlike the blood capillary, this lymphatic capillary is close-ended. Look, it ends there. Blood capillaries don't really end there in that sense. They kind of start at an arterial, they branch a great deal, they uh, then fuse again to form a venule. But you can literally point and say that's where this capillary uh, starts. When fluid begins to accumulate in this tissue, because more fluid leaves than returns, then that puts pressure on uh, the junctions between these endothelial uh, cells lining the lymphatic capillary. And this allows uh, lymph to enter the, um, this lymphatic capillary. Each of these cells kind of acts like a tiny valve uh, where it will let fluid enter, but it won't let fluid leave. And so we have excess fluid uh, in this tissue because not as much returns to the veins. Um, and that's a reason for the lymphatic system. Uh, this tissue, uh, this fluid then enters lymphatic vessels and becomes lymph. And then the lymph can uh, be returned uh, to, uh, uh, the lymph can then be returned to the 
in the blood system, um, the blood vessels fuse and get bigger and bigger. So we think of veins. So capillaries form venules, which form small veins, which form larger veins. Just as you know, small streets can form you know, larger streets or boulevards, which can fuse, fuse to make highways and interstates, et cetera. Well, the same thing here. These lymphatic capillaries then fuse to make uh, lymphatic uh, vessels, uh, which then get larger and larger then as they are moving towards the um, uh, uh, towards uh, the heart. Eventually, uh, they form large lymphatic uh, trunks, which then empty back into the blood. So here you can see the right lymphatic duct, which is draining lymph from the right part of the head and the right arm, and it enters here. And here you can see the, uh, uh, the what's called the thoracic uh, duct, um, which not only drains the left part of the head, and the uh, left arm, but also the inferior part of uh, the body. And so uh, if you remember the veins, the one superior vena cava branches to make two brachiocephalic veins, and then each brachiocephalic vein branches to make a, um, a jugular and a subclavian vein. These lymphatic trunks empty into uh, the junction where the um, internal jugular and the subclavian are fusing to make the brachiocephalic veins. So this lymph, while it is here in this green lymphatic vessel, um, we call it lymph. But the minute it gets here to the brachiocephalic vein, um, then it is now called blood. It's plasma once again. And so the fluid here left the blood plasma um, and was collecting the tissues, the lymphatic system collected it and now is delivering it once again uh, back into the blood. That way we don't end the day with less fluid in our blood than uh, we began. Now, just as a break uh, in a large uh, blood vessel uh, can be potentially fatal just because of the fluid that we lose, a break in a large lymphatic vessel can be potentially fatal because of the fluid uh, that we would lose. Now, uh, there's also a few other uh, similarities um, in that um, since here is where the lymphatic vessels are uh, emptying uh, into the blood, uh, just as the veins help to move their blood through the respiratory muscles, when we create an area of low pressure here because muscles are making the thorax bigger, that helps to draw blood closer to the heart. In the same way, lymph is being uh, drawn closer to the brachiocephalic veins in the same way. Um, just as uh, blood vessels, uh, the veins can have valves uh, which stop blood from going the wrong way, lymphatic vessels can have valves to stop lymph from going the wrong way. In fact, lymphatic vessels have more valves than veins do, giving them a beaded appearance. Just as the skeletal muscles around a vein uh, can contract uh, to create the pressure which pushes uh, blood towards the heart. Uh, the lymphatic vessels are being squeezed by the same skeletal uh, muscle uh, contractions and thus the lymph is being pumped closer to uh, the heart. And so uh, we have two systems of vessels in our body in addition to the blood vessels and we also have these lymphatic vessels which are collecting fluid which has left the blood and then uh, they return it to the blood uh, here uh, where the brachiocephalic veins form and they make use of skeletal muscle uh, contractions and valves to help move this low pressure lymph just as uh, the, um, the veins did. So when studying the anatomy of the lymphatic system, certainly there are those vessels. And now let's look at the other lymphatic tissues. And then here we see uh, one of uh, the problems. Um, this is the wall of the small intestine. Because it's the wall of the small intestine, one would assume that this then is a digestive, uh, you know, uh, organ with, a, with digestive tissues. But here in the middle of the small intestine, if you were to look under a microscope, is patch after patch after patch of immune cells as part of the lymphatic system. Now, these aren't organs, all right, because uh, they're not made of multiple tissues. They don't have this connective tissue wrapping, which would set them apart from neighboring structures. And so therefore, it's easy to miss them if you don't, you know, look uh, closely uh, enough. And so when we look at the lymphatic 
uh, system and ask, well, what anatomical structures are there? It's easy not to be impressed. Okay, so you have lymph nodes, you have the spleen. I guess we can include the bone marrow. There's the thymus. Anything else? Um, well, in addition to the organs that I just named, uh, there are tissues which aren't organs. All right, and so we have you know a lot of diffuse lymphatic you know tissue just all over the, all over the place, um, and then we have discrete nodules. So there's discrete lymphatic you know tissues, um, but they aren't recognized as organs because they don't have multiple uh, tissues, nor are they wrapped in uh, connective tissue. And so therefore, the tonsils in uh, the mouth. If you weren't looking closely, you would say, oh, well, the mouth. That's a uh, a respiratory uh, and, and a digestive structure. Uh, the pharynx, uh, like the nasopharynx, that's um, a respiratory structure. Um, but then in the middle of it, there are five masses of tonsils, uh, two lingual tonsils, two palatine tonsils, one pharyngeal tonsil. They are immune structures. Here in the uh, small intestine, there are Peyer's patches. Attached to the large intestine, there is an appendix. So once again, they aren't organs, but nevertheless, uh, they are lymphatic uh, structures. Now, these are obvious enough to see if you're, say, looking at a, a, a under a microscope. It, it's a discrete patch. Um, but there is so much lymphatic tissue in uh, the body that, for example, if we were to take mucous membranes in general, um, we could just refer to, well, there's just you know, so much lymphatic tissue, say in the submucosa, um, that we could just refer to it all collectively as MOLT, the mucosa-associated lymphatic uh, tissue. Some people would even refer to the gastrointestinal tract as GOLT, you know, the gastrointestinal-associated lymphatic tissue. Um, so it's easy to miss this because it's not a it isn't even a discrete nodule, um, but there is a lot of lymphatic uh, tissue uh, here. So much so that you know there can be more uh, uh, you know lymphatic tissue, more white blood cells uh, here in malt than the rest of uh, the body. Um, now, once again, many people would not be impressed. So, for example, if I were to say the brain. Well, you're impressed by the brain. It's big, it's solid, it's got like all these chapters of the book dedicated to it. If I were to say, say, lymphocytes, eh, less so. But if you could take all of your body's lymphocytes and put them in one place, they would equal the weight of the brain. We have a huge lymphatic system, a huge lymphatic system, but it is so spread out, it is so diffused that it's easy to miss. So there's a lot of diffuse tissues, and then there are uh, then these uh, discrete nodules like tonsils, payers, patches, and uh, the appendix. There are a few actual organs where there are multiple tissues. And, you know, it's easy to see because it's wrapped in connective tissue separated from uh, other um, uh, tissues. So this would include the spleen. We only have one of those, and that's the largest lymphatic structure in the body. There are a series of lymph nodes uh, throughout uh, the body. Um, and these we call secondary lymphatic organs. Um, this is where there's a lot of, uh, you know, say combat between your white blood cells and microbes and antigens, all right? So, you know, when you recognize foreign substances and attack them, a lot of that's going on here. I mean, here as well, but as far as the organs go, in the secondary lymphatic organs, um, you know, they are primarily where white blood cells are encountering antigens. Um, but then we also refer to two primary lymphatic organs. There's not as much interaction between, say, white blood cells and microbes happening there, but rather this is where white blood cells are made, all right? So all white blood cells uh, are, uh, you know, initially made in the bone marrow, as are all blood cells, um, and then uh, some mature in the thymus. So the red bone marrow and the thymus, they are considered primary lymphatic organs, uh, while the spleen and the lymph nodes, uh, they are uh, considered uh, secondary uh, lymphatic uh, organs. So uh, the primary lymphatic organs, they're considered as part of the immune system, and I often make that comparison of, say, West Point. Is West Point you know, involved in the military? Yes. Are battles being fought there? No. But this is where individuals who might go off and fight in conflicts are then trained. And in the same way, 
um, when you look at the bone marrow and the thymus are battles between your white blood cells and, um, uh, and microbes occurring there? No, but this is where white blood cells are made. So now let's look at uh, lymph nodes. Lymph nodes have reticular tissue, and reticular tissue is very common in the lymphatic system. You may remember from AM, AMP1, one of the three kinds of extracellular protein fibers are these reticular fibers. And they kind of form this mesh, all right? And uh, in this mesh now, you can have many white uh, blood cells. You know, uh, you know I, I sometimes, you know, compare it to, you know, like here's a spider web and all of the white blood cells, you know, are just, you know, uh, hunting um, uh, there for uh, microbes. Clearly, you can see all of, uh, the white blood cells here, um, and then there can, uh, you know, be lymphocytes, which are producing antibodies that go into the blood. So after you have, say, an encounter um, between, you know, your immune system and the um, and the microbes, uh, that you know, then you can mount a defense. Uh, the lymph nodes uh, can be an important uh, part of that. Lymph nodes are uh, small bean-shaped. Uh, structures. Uh, some are uh, larger than others. They're often clustered in different parts of the body, so in uh, the neck, the armpits, uh, the groin uh, region, but they can be th uh, found uh, throughout. Um, here we have that reticular uh, tissue, and um, and there are a series of lymphatic vessels which come in, afferent vessels. And then there are two lymphatic uh, vessels uh, which leave these efferent vessels. So lymph is going to come in here and then leave here. Now, it isn't a race, so we aren't trying to hurry this along, because while the lymph is then passing uh, through uh, that reticular tissue, notice that you know, spider web of fibers, um, the lymph is more or less being filtered and here we have all of these white blood cells, which are looking for microbes, looking for antigens, looking for toxins, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I sometimes compare this, you know, if you drive along a highway and you see, say, a state trooper, you know, monitoring the situation. So this highway has a lot of traffic and that state trooper is sitting in a spot where uh, they can, you know, monitor looking for signs of trouble. Here we have fluid coming back from different tissues of the body. Are there infections? Well, I don't know. But here's fluid coming from this tissue. Here's fluid you know, coming from that tissue in a different spot. It's all passing through this central location. So here we can filter that uh, uh, fluid and then uh, uh, monitor it for uh, microbes, et cetera. I'm sure you, we've all had the uh, experience where your lymph node seems swollen one day, and then the next day you feel a little sick. Your lymph nodes uh, were the first to realize that there was an invader of uh, the body. Uh, and uh, they then started to mount uh, an attack. You saw the inflammation uh, here. And you know, uh, you know, so uh, this was one of the first places that uh, that microbe uh, was uh, recognized. Also, cancer cells can be monitored uh, here because if cells are starting to move inappropriately, so you know the, a, a cancer is metastasizing, and so cells are breaking away from our primary tumor and going to secondary tumors, um, uh, they then can attempt to travel through the lymph. So white blood cells can attempt to you know recognize uh, cancer cells and mount a defense. And when we're considering whether uh, a tumor uh, is a malignant tumor which is metastasizing, we could screen you know, surrounding lymph nodes to see if, the, um, if cancer cells have uh, reached that yet. And so the lymph nodes are monitoring. Now, forgive me, I just want to backtrack. I, forgive me, I forgot a video. Um, so uh, there is a lot of monitoring. So here, these uh, payers patches in uh, the uh, intestine, uh, which will also then be covered uh, later in the, uh, the digestive system. Um, they are monitoring. So if there's potentially microbes in uh, the diet, here we have white blood cells in a position where they can um, uh, encounter antigens uh, which are in uh, the ingested food and then mount uh, the proper uh, uh, responses. And so when we produce, say, antibodies against um, 
you know, microbes to uh, maintain their populations. It was in large part because of the monitoring that was, you know, going on uh, here in this example from um, uh, the payer's patches. So here's all these white blood cells that actually come in contact with uh, the, uh, uh, the food that we're ingesting. Um, and then that, uh, it's, uh, the appendix, which is attached to the cecum of the large uh, intestine, uh, also there we are uh, monitoring. We have incredible numbers of uh, microbes in our large intestine. You know, of the two pounds of bacteria associated with our body, the majority of them are in uh, the large uh, intestine. And so the uh, vermiform appendix then has populations of uh, white blood cells, uh, so attached to the cecum in humans. This is a cecum in um, uh, a herbivore. Uh, then uh, our uh, appendix can then uh, be in a position where it can screen all of these uh, bacteria with the white blood cells, uh, which are uh, located here. So um, many uh, populations of white blood cells are just kind of monitoring uh, the environment for microbes. The tonsils are doing that uh, near the portals of entry in the uh, mouth and oral uh, and nasal cavities. Uh, the uh, payer's patches and the appendix are doing that in the intestines. Uh, the lymph nodes are now uh, screening lymph and looking for uh, microbes. And then uh, finally, the spleen can do this as well with blood. Now, the spleen is a large organ. It's the largest uh, lymphatic structure in uh, the body. And it has two distinct uh, masses of uh, you know, tissue. We refer to the red pulp as that area which is uh, very rich in uh, blood vessels. Um, so you know, there's so much blood stored in the spleen that actually one of our defenses uh, in hemorrhage is that now the spleen can release all of its blood. And if we were to undergo um, blood uh, loss, now uh, you know, uh, much of the spleen's blood can then enter uh, circulation. Um, so uh, there's only one uh, spleen. It's located on the left side of the body uh, underneath uh, the uh, stomach. Uh, and once again, the largest lymphatic structure in the body. It has both a uh, red pulp uh, where old red blood cells can be phagocytized. And so, as mentioned earlier, we don't want red blood cells bursting on their own because that could potentially clog uh, blood vessels. And so, uh, while red blood cells are in the red pulp of uh, the spleen, uh, old ones uh, can uh, undergo phagocytosis uh, by white blood cells as macrophages. Their hemoglobin can be broken down as uh, red uh, spleen uh, is a uh, red blood cell. But in addition, there is a white uh, spleen, um, which are tissue kind of as the lymph or filtering lymph or um, signs of here, no white blood cells filtering blood. And so your blood is screened for bacteria, cancer cells, etc. all of the spleen. So once again, look for lymph and look for side infection and a white pulp of the spleen uh, for. Uh, and so, you know, here's just another uh, few images of the spleen. Once again, the lymph nodes in spleen are referred to as secondary. Um, they're actually wood tissues. They have their own. That clearly sets them apart. Uh, from, and here, there's a great deal, uh, you know, encounters between white cells and microbes. Finally, there are those two lymphatic uh, organs. Um, here, uh, uh, it's not as much an opportunity for white blood cells to encounter microbes as a place to produce the white blood cells, which will then do that in other structures. So we have a thymus, all right, this is one structure which is just deep to the uh, sternum. That image of the newborn there was significant because relative to the rest of the body, the thymus is largest in newborns. Um, it decreases in size over eight as we age, and as we reach an advanced age, it might essentially just be, you know, a, a fatty uh, mass and no longer functional in the immune system. This is one of the reasons that the elderly would represent an increased risk for infection because one of their lymphatic organs, the thymus, may no longer be functional. Uh, when we look at lymphocytes, we'll see that there are two kinds of lymphocytes. One type of lymphocyte is called a T lymphocyte because they mature in the thymus. Um, 
And so uh, when we look in uh, the thymus, this is incredibly uh, important. So here, uh, here are some uh, bisections uh, with uh, the thymus. This would lie over the trachea uh, and uh, the great vessels of uh, the heart. Um, uh, and uh, inside here are um, uh, lots of uh, white blood cells, primarily lymphocytes. T lymphocytes get their name because they uh, mature here. And uh, for example, in the discussion on asthma, it becomes very important how white blood cells mature. Are they encouraged to you know, fight more infectious agents or encouraged to you know, uh, promote inflammation, which if done in excess would make asthma uh, worse, would make one disposed to asthma? Well, a lot of that training is going on in the thymus. The thymus secretes a number of hormones. Uh, collectively, these hormones are known as thymosins, but there are different ones. And they are helping um, the uh, T lymphocytes develop in a way uh, that uh, will allow the body to fight future uh, infections. Um, one of the things uh, that will be mentioned uh, presently is that um, when we develop these immune cells prepared to fight uh, off uh, you know, potential infectious agents, um, we certainly don't want them to be able uh, to attack our own body and cause an autoimmune disease. And when, uh, in the discussion of blood typing, obviously someone who's blood type A doesn't want to make antibodies against uh, blood type A. And so in the thymus, there's a whole lot of education uh, which is uh, going uh, on. Um, we want uh, both uh, positive uh, uh, selection um, where uh, we want um, uh, white blood cells which will be able to react uh, to uh, foreign uh, invaders. Um, but then uh, we also want negative selection where we don't want white blood cells which will react against self. All right, and so the thymus, um, I made that allusion to say, you know, West Point or a military academy. Battles aren't fought there, but it's where training occurs. We need to train our white uh, blood cells. Uh, we need them to, you know, we need to encourage those which will react against uh, foreign antigens and discourage those uh, which uh, will react against self. So a lot of this selection, both positive and negative selection, is occurring in the thymus. Finally, as far as lymphatic uh, organs, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and then just uh, in uh, this video, um, there are lymphocytes in uh, the thymus, obviously the T lymphocytes, um, but their training is aided uh, by uh, others. So macrophages and dendritic cells are wearing things. They are presenting to these lymphocytes to help in their training. And then we also have epithelial cells um, and so uh, the thymus you know, has a number of different uh, cell uh, types in it, and so I'll go through some of those uh, here. Finally, the last um, organ of the lymphatic system uh, is the bone marrow. Now, when we refer to bone marrow, there is yellow bone marrow, which contains uh, fat. That's not uh, primarily what uh, we are uh, discussing. Um, instead, uh, we're looking at the red bone marrow, which in adults might be, say, in flat bones, in irregular bones, or say the proximal epiphysis of, say, the femur and um, the humerus. Um, so here you see bone marrow, and every single second, millions of white blood cells are made. So this is not primarily a site where uh, we have uh, interactions between white blood cells and microbes, but rather uh, where we are making those um, where we're uh, making these uh, white blood cells, which will go elsewhere and then contact these uh, antigens. All right. So um, the lymphatic system is a little difficult uh, to study because it's rather diffuse. There's a little bit of it everywhere. Um, so here's just an example. Uh, when we talk about the negative effects of weight gain, um, uh, certainly, uh, adipose cells make some hormones. So as I gain more weight, then I'm making too many of, of certain hormones and that could have an adverse health effect. 
Um, but then also there's white blood cells in adipose. And as we gain weight, then some of the signals which we don't like in excess adipose are actually coming from the white blood cells. So there are white blood cells you know, everywhere. And there's you know, diffuse aspects of the, um, the uh, lymphatic and immune systems uh, everywhere. And just getting back to those white blood cells, uh, just their name, white blood cells, implies that they're in the blood. They are not. If you, you know, remember when we look at a blood slide, you know, there's a white blood cell over here, and then you sc scroll over, there's a white blood cell over there. There's not a lot of white blood cells in blood. But if we were to look under the microscope at the tonsil, the thymus, the spleen, the lymph node, the pears patch, and the appendix, look at the tonsil. All of those are white blood cells. Look at the thymus. All of those are white blood cells. Look at the white uh, pulp of the spleen. Look at a lymph node. Look at a payer's patch or the um, appendix. So uh, white blood cells are primarily in the lymphatic uh, system. They are not primarily in the blood, most of which have left the blood. And, and we have huge num numbers of lymphocytes or uh, and white blood cells in general. So once again, just the lymphocytes alone would weigh as much as uh, the brain. And so um, the anatomy of this system is a little difficult to study because the anatomy is so uh, diffuse. We do have lymphatic vessels. Um, we have definite uh, primary organs where we make uh, white blood cells, such as the red bone marrow and the thymus where they mature. We have secondary lymphatic organs where there's you know, an organ where white blood cells are fighting antigens, such as lymph nodes in the spleen. But then we have lots of nodules, such as tonsils, payers, patches, the appendix. And then there's diffuse lymphatic tissue you know, just all over the place. And so the lymphatic system anatomy is, is much more extensive than we often think of it, um, but it's also then more uh, diffuse. So most of our discussion on the lymphatic system then revolves around the physiology of immunity, which is the next topic.